Good day my friend, it's good to see you again. I assume you want me to continue the tale of the legendary heroes of Waterdeep. Make yourself comfortable, and I will continue. After having an eventful second trip in the Blue Alley Dungeon, our heroes had an easy afternoon in Trollskull Manor. The next morning, while eating breakfast, our heroes were interrupted by a knock at the door. It would seem they were going to have another eventful day. Kaimin answered the door, and was surprised to see a hairy man, that he recognized as one of Baron Arthur Morlin's werewolves. Yes, this was going to be a very eventful day. The werewolf bowed before speaking, I am here on behalf of my lord, the Baron Morlin. He wishes to have a progress report on your task. He wants to see you as soon as possible, as it is a matter of great urgency. Kaimin holds a finger up indicating one moment, and turns to Holt and Grid, Baron Morlin wants to see us urgently for a progress report. Holt stands up, then I guess we are having breakfast later. Liv, could you help me put my armor on? Pieces of armor start floating in the air towards Holt. Grid stands up, and starts pacing the room, disappointed his breakfast was interrupted, the barbarian not realizing he had time to finish while Holt got his armor on. Kaimin turns back to the werewolf, we will be ready to go in a few minutes. Once our heroes are ready, they head off to the city of the dead with the werewolf, and make their way to Baron Morlin's crypt. Once in the crypt they are taken straight to see the Baron. Our heroes thought the Baron was angry and intimidating the first time they met him, well in comparison, the Baron was in a good mood that day. As soon as our heroes enter the room, the Baron asks, have you found a suitable lair for me in Undermountain? Grid begins, well, we did find a nice dwarven place with a bath, that could be quite hard for adventurers to find. Holt then adds, it's even got a grate for easy access. Grind turns to Holt confused, a grate there was no grate. Holt replies through gritted teeth, yes there was the plug in the bath, but I was trying not to say that in front of the Baron. Baron Maul in his patience wearing thin, raises his voice, enough. I have heard from my spies in the city that there have been some vampire attacks in the dock ward, and if that was not enough, more adventurers turned up with a damp map. Standing off to one side are a pair of adventurers, a female gnome fighter with hair half pink and half blue, and a human monk, both look a little uneasy at the mention of adventurers and a map. Grid mutters under his breath, Ian you had better not have had anything to do with this. Holt thinks for a moment before mentioning, we have a possible explanation for the dock ward attacks. We have heard there is a vampire already on the first floor of Under Mountain. Kaimin follows up, there may be a vampire. We know one of the three answers was a lie. Baron Morlin signals to one of his werewolves, before asking our heroes, how about we make our arrangement more formal, and you deal with any vampires you find on the first floor? An hour later when the contract has been drawn up, and read through thoroughly by our heroes, or at least some of our heroes, they leave accompanied by the two adventurers. Once our heroes have left the Baron's presence, they introduce themselves to the two adventurers. The gnome then introduces herself as Larilla Wildwander, but I am sure you already knew by the hair, that she was the slightly clumsy tinkerer who would go on to be the great champion of Feyran. The monk introduces himself as Oakley Stone Dreamer, who I am sure you worked out by this point, that he was the enlightened one. When our heroes get out of the City of the Dead, they decide to head to Trollskull Alley to pick up supplies, before venturing into Under Mountain. The walk goes by quite quickly for Larilla and Holt, who spark up conversation about tinkering and metalworking. The walk seems to take an eternity for the others, who had to listen to the conversation. Our heroes first visit Fala, and stock up on healing potions. Grid also gets a potion of climbing. They then head to Steam and Steel, where they see Embrick working on creating a set of new of plate. Once the Genesee notices he has company and stops working, Holt introduces him to Larilla. After a small exchange of pleasantries, Larilla asks, do you have any spare bits of metal, maybe some cogs? Embrick points to a large bucket, that's my junk bucket, all my cuttings and broken bits go in there. Larilla climbs up onto the side of the bucket and as she reaches in, she almost falls in, but luckily there was a large piece of metal, that she braced her weight against. After a few minutes pulling out all the useful bits she can find, she fills her bag up and goes to Embrick, how much for this? The Genesee carefully looks over the contents of the bag, five dragons. 
Larilla leaves steam and steel with a large smile on her face, though some of her companions wonder why she spent so much on junk. As our heroes make their way to the yawning portal, a paper bird swoops down from the air to Kaimin. After Kaimin reads the message, our heroes continue on to the yawning portal and when they arrive the tavern is fairly busy, with a jolly atmosphere. As our heroes make their way to a table, they hear that they have just missed an adventuring party going down into Under Mountain, but are just in time for a performance from Three Strings the Bard. Kaimin begins to look around for suspicious activity, and looking for someone out of place and who does not look like they belong. After a few minutes of people watching, he notices a beautiful noblewoman walk up to the bar, and when I greeted her, like me he noticed that Nanitha was not herself, and did not seem to recognize me even though we had been friends for years. When Nanitha got her drink, Kaimin followed her to where she sat down, at an empty table right in front of the stage, just as Three Strings finishes his first song of the performance. As Kaimin pulls a seat at the table out, he asks, Do you mind if I sit here? The woman nods nervously, and as Kaimin sits down, he begins to make small conversation with the woman, and Three Strings steps down from the stage stepping between the two, seeming quite protective of the woman. The bard smiles, How may I help you? Kaimin replies, I am just getting to know her and her kind. Three Strings noticing Kaimin's harper brooch comments, If the wrong person finds out about her and her kind, they may kill them. Kaimin nods, Yes, I can see why people would be unhappy with her kind. Three Strings bent in closer to Kaimin, as a favor to Bonnie the barmaid, I am trying to gather a few of her and Nanitha's kind, and help them out the city, would you be interested in helping get them out, if I gather them together? Kaimin asks, how long will it take to gather them together? Three Strings replies, a couple of days. Kaimin nods, yes that should be okay. Three Strings makes his way back on the stage and starts performing again, but as Kaimin suspected something was amiss with the bard he watches intently, but Three Strings seems to perform, with the ability you would expect from an experienced bard. Meanwhile, the rest of our heroes have begun inquiring with fellow adventurers about Undermountain, in an attempt to get more information about the dungeon. Grid gets talking to a young halfling, who informs him, deep within Undermountain, is a vast cavern containing a giant stalagmite that has been hollowed out, to serve as a wizard's tower, perhaps even a refuge for the mad mage himself. The tower is guarded by stone constructs. No one knows what dwells inside. Not far from this tower lurks a most peculiar creature, a giant snail, with a shell of pure gold. Holt is approached by a pair of aging men, the first of which tells him, the mad mage has transformed an entire level of Undermountain into a proving ground for adventurers, who seek to reach the deepest layers of the dungeon, and the treasures hidden within. At the end of this underground obstacle course, waits the greatest challenge of all, Nether Skull the Death Tyrant, an undead beholder, that hates wizards above all. The second man follows up, if you hope to get that deep into Undermountain, you better bring Antivenom. Those depths are crawling with them spider-loving drow. Larilla bumps into a copper-skinned dragonborn, who with concern in his voice asks, Apologies my little friend, are you okay? I did not see you there, my eyesight's not what it used to be. I have been thinking of going down into Undermountain, as I hear there is a goblin bazaar. Though I imagine the goblins won't be as kind as you, when I accidentally walk into them. Oakley speaks with an elven ranger, who informs him, Folks have been saying, there's a vampire out there on the first level of the dungeon. Expects a toll to be paid, or an eternity as her thrall. Our heroes all gather back together, and make their final preparations, before they came to me, and ask about the party that went down before them. I told them, they are a two-bit adventuring party called the Cheeky Pluckers, led by a human knight called Fiona de Vaughan, and consist of a gnome commonly referred to as Fourfingers, Halbert the Dwarf, a drow by the name of Serial and the half-elf Danny Elfman, who is fond of telling long-winded tales. Ready to head into Undermountain, each of our heroes gave me a golden dragon. They then made their way to the platform, and as they stand on it, the yawning portal starts to quieting down. Recognizing most of the heroes a voice shouts, Ten Dragons says they will be back within three hours, another voice shouts, they have been down before, Twelve Dragons says they will be back within five hours. With the creak and groans of the winch, our heroes begun to descend down the well. Grid looks around, to see if the guy whose nose he broke is there, and sure enough he notices the man, his nose still bent out of shape. 
Before the platform disappears out of sight, Grid and the man make eye contact and the man nervously stands up, Ten Dragon says they will last. Last a whole day and the dumb. The one who broke my nose will still be alive when they return. The noise of the yawning portal soon began to quieten, as our heroes are lowered down, and down, into the mythic depths, the only light coming from Holt's now drawn sword. For our heroes who had been down before, they knew what to expect, but Lorilla and Oakley began to feel anxious, for though adventure loomed, so too did the possibility of death. As the platform touched the floor, all our heroes were ready, with an alertness of veteran adventurers, and our heroes headed to the room with a forest of pillars, half expecting another ambush from bugbears. However, as they enter the room they hear a voice shout, those with the light, come and pay homage to the ghoul king. There are four ghouls in the room, one of which has a golden crown on its head. Everyone notices that Grid's knuckles are white, as he grips his axe ready to charge. Lorilla charges one of the ghouls, and is surprised, when her strike she was sure was going to miss, hits, as Holt calls on Tempest to guide her attack. Grid roars like a bear and charges another ghoul, and hits with a pair of mighty swings, while Kaimin shoots a pair of crossbow bolts into the ghoul, that Lorilla injured. The ghoul king shouts, they are disrespecting me. Kill them. Oakley runs forward, and swings his quarterstaff connecting with the ghoul king's face, but the attack does not look very effective. However, the monk follows up with a series of quick punches that reel the ghoul king. Holt moves up and attacks a ghoul with his sword, which proves to be very effective, before the ghoul's counterattack, but both Holt and Larilla's armor absorb most of the attacks coming their way, however Grid gets hit several times. Kaimin shoots the ghoul nearest Grid, with a crossbow bolt killing the creature with a well-aimed shot to its eye. Grid swings wildly and takes a chunk of flesh off the ghoul king's shoulder. As the barbarian's reckless attacks left him open, the ghoul king stabs him in the ribs, but before any serious damage can be done, Oakley Roundhouse kicks the ghoul king in the face. The power of the monk's foot snaps the neck of the ghoul king, killing him instantly. As the ghoul king drops to the floor, his crown falls off and rolls across the room, and comes to a stop when it hits the wall. Holt and Larilla double-team a ghoul, and leave it wobbling, before Kaimin finishes it off, with a shot from his crossbow. The last ghoul is soon surrounded by our heroes, and takes several hits, before Kaimin gets the final hit, killing it with a shot from his crossbow. Our heroes begin to make their way through the dungeon, towards the cupboard where they found the weasel hiding. On their way our heroes pass through the room with the broken arch, and Grid can't resist stepping through, and the barbarian turns invisible again. Lorilla is excited to try the arch out and walks through, but is disappointed when nothing happens. However, she soon regrets stepping back through it, as there is a build-up of energy that sparks winding her when it releases. The rest of our heroes wisely avoid the broken arch. It does not take long for our heroes to get back to the tunnel leading to the room with the cupboard, and our heroes cautiously make their way down the tunnel, on the lookout for Grix. Our heroes get to the room with the cupboard without issue, and follow a tunnel they previously had not explored, around to a room, where they see a pair of Grix and a large Grix Alpha. Kaimin is at the front of the party along with the still invisible grid, and the rogue takes the full brunt of the Grix assault. Luckily though Lorilla is nearby, and intercepts most of the assault with her shield. Kaimin takes the opportunity to retreat from the front line, as Grid roars like a bear before he becomes visible, as he kills one of the Grix. Holt then steps up into the space vacated by Kaimin, and kills the other Grix. It takes a full party effort from our heroes to bring down the Alpha Grick, which is resistant to most of their attacks. Oakley's fists though prove to be a powerful weapon, and after dealing most of the damage, the monk also gets the killing blow. Once the Alpha is dead, Grid eager to carry on exploring, rushes across the room. Everyone is surprised when Grid runs into some sort of reverse gravity field, and is suddenly running across the ceiling before returning to the floor, as he left the room at the other side. Their attention brought to the ceiling, our heroes notice there is an upside-down throne, seated upon which is a mummified minotaur, with gems embedded in its eyes. Kaimin cautiously makes his way into the reverse gravity, before carefully examining the mummy. Confident there is not a trap, Kaimin removes the gemstones from the mummy's eyes. One gemstone is a banded gate and the other a zircon. The tunnel leading out the reverse gravity room, connects back up to a previously explored tunnel, 
and our heroes leave the area as it is now fully explored and make their way to the nearest unexplored corridor. The corridor is an angled corridor that leads to a large room, and as our heroes creep across the room, Holt's foot strikes a loose stone, sending it tumbling down the hall. In response, our heroes hear a voice shout, You there? Answer my call and join me on this quest for justice. Our heroes notice the voices coming from a pit, yawning in the center of the room. As they approach, they notice its walls are as smooth as a newborn's cheeks, and at the bottom of its rubble-strewn depths stands a blooded half-elf. So bruised that he is green and purple. His arm is bent at an angle it is not intended to go, and an eyeball hangs by a tatter of flesh, but the elf shows no pain. The elf looks at our heroes and meets their surprised gaze with his good eye, I compel you, free me so that I may avenge my death and join her grace in the gilded afterlife. Holt strokes his beard, he must be a revenant. Oakley turns to Holt and asks, what is a revenant? Holt continues to stroke his beard, tangling his fingers in it, a revenant forms from the soul of a mortal who met a cruel and undeserving fate. It claws its way back into the world to seek revenge against the one who wronged it. At least that's what I read once. Grid looks down the pit and shouts, Who are you and how did you get down there? The Revenant replies, I am Halith Gark and my treacherous brethren beat me and chucked me down here for demanding an equal share of the treasure. Kaimin recognizing the name Halith Gark asks, Who are your treacherous brethren? Halith replies, Copper Storm Forge, along with Rex the Hammer and Midna Torbeth. Kaimin turns to the rest of our heroes, the fine, or by the sounds of it, not so fine fellows of Daggerford. Friends of the Weasel. Holt asks the others, should we help him out? As the rest of the group discuss if they should help Halith out, Larilla begins lowering a rope down the pit. Our heroes decide to help, and are surprised when they look at the pit and see the form of Halith climbing out. Once out the pit, Halith smiles, thank you, I am looking forward to wringing Copper Stormforge's thick little neck. I can sense them down below us. The pit situation resolved, our heroes then notice a large elaborate carving on the wall. As they look at the image, they notice it is a cross-section map of Undermountain, with what is clearly Mount Waterdeep and the City of Splendors at the top, and 23 hollowed-out dungeon levels stacked below it. Each dungeon level has its own stylistic side view, but no names or details are included to suggest what a level is called or what it contains. There are three features on the map that stand out. Next to the third level is a base relief of a flaming skull, next to the sixteenth level is a base relief of a comet, and next to the twenty-third and lowest level is a base relief of a tower with a tiny rune engraved above it. A closer inspection reveals that the three base reliefs are buttons that can be pressed. Before anyone can react, Grid eager to find out what the buttons do, pushes the flaming skull. A male voice fills the room, gate access to skullport disabled. Grid then presses the comet and the male voice fills the room again, this time saying, gate access to Stardock from level 16 only. When Grid presses the last button, the tower, the male voice says, gate access to Halasta's tower from level 23 only. While Grid checks next to each level for a hidden button, and does not find any, Larilla starts pressing the buttons, and is disappointed the voice says the same things again. She is satisfied though, when she quickly presses all three buttons, and the male voice says all three sentences simultaneously, creating a babble making the voice difficult to understand. At the south of the room is a fairly obvious secret door, and the dust in the corridor beyond has been disturbed, by humanoid footprints of all shapes and sizes, indicating that a lot of traffic passes through the corridor. At the end of the corridor is a well-used secret door, leading into a large hall, with a deformed granite statue on the east side of a large column. The statue is a life-sized dwarf king, standing atop a three-foot-high stone pedestal. Unusually sprouting from the king's neck is a deformed, mostly featureless second head, with an elongated toothless mouth. On the king's brow rests an engraved stone circlet, and his large hands grasp the handle of a stone warhammer, the head of which is planted at his feet. To the left of the statue of the two-headed king is a set of stairs heading down, just as the voice that Grid heard in his head predicted. Before our heroes can investigate further, they hear the sound of squabbling emanating from a corridor leading north. Our heroes decide to head north, however the revenant, sensing his target is somewhere down the stairs runs off down them. 
As our heroes sneak down the corridor, they can see 19 loud starving goblins, bickering and fighting. A 20th goblin lies dead on the floor, the first casualty of the argument. The goblins are totally unaware of our hero's approach, and Kaimin uses his wand of web to ensnare as many as he can. Grid rushes in and with wild swings of his axe kills five goblins, Oakley also kills five of the goblins, with a combination of punches and hits from his quarterstaff. Holt kills a pair of goblins, as does Larilla and Kaimin. The last three goblins are stuck deeper in the web, and it's lucky Kaimin webbed them, as they almost certainly would have ran off into the darkness. Grid switches to his pike, and the extra reach of the weapon makes it easy for him to kill two more goblins without stepping into the web. Larilla kills the final goblin with a hurled throwing axe. However, the noise of one of the easiest fights our heroes will ever have attracted the attention of a pair of Ettins, who get stuck in the web as they approach. Just as a trio of bugbears assault from the south, and things get a whole lot more difficult. Grid charges one of the bugbears killing it with a strike from his axe, however an intellect devourer bursts from its head, and in a psionic assault turns Grid into a vegetable, after destroying the little intelligence he has. Seeing his friend is in great danger, Holt rushes over and kills the intellect devourer, before it can enter the barbarian's head. A few seconds later, the tattoo of Grid's charm that he received from the unicorn begins to glow, before disappearing, restoring the barbarian's intelligence. Meanwhile, Larilla with the help of Oakley kills a bugbear, and they are both thankful, an intellect devourer does not burst out. Kaimin begins to pepper one of the Ettins with crossbow bolts. The now restored Grid gets back on his feet and uses his pike to finish the Etting off, before stabbing the pike through the final bugbear's chest killing it. The barbarian sighs in relief that an intellect devourer does not burst out. The two heads of the final Etting stop arguing and tear themselves free of the web, and make their way down towards Kaimin. However, Oakley rushes the giant and with a flurry of powerful punches, kills it. Our heroes in need of a short break, head back to the room with the cupboard. And that would seem like a good place for me to leave the tale for today.